or anybody know how many jobs we've lost officially during the recession? We've lost 1.4 million jobs officially. The unemployment rate in December of 2007 was 5.9%. Last month it was 12.4%. 1.4 million jobs being lost obviously has an impact on tax collections. The three largest revenue sources being income taxes, followed by sales taxes, followed by corporate taxes. So if people lose their jobs, they're not paying as much as income. If they have less disposable income, they're not going out and eating at Applebee's or other restaurants as frequently. And if you're not shopping at Nordstrom's Rack as frequently, Nordstrom's has less money. But the expenditures, and anybody know what the three largest expenditures for the, for the state are? Education. <coughs> Education, Sharon, very good. What's prisons. prisons is number three. What's healthcare, healthcare is number two. Very good, healthcare and social services. A lot of that, the prices and the costs actually increase in weak economic years because there's greater needs for those types of services. So that's why it calls for a rainy day fund or some type of savings or paying down debt during good years. That's one of the things we have to be very intelligent about going forward. So that's the position we are in. Uh, it's going to take six to eight years of solid budgeting for the state to get back to a decent position because our deficits are so large. And so Governor Brown has a proposal that gets us on that pathway. We will see if he picks up uh, some Republican legislator support and if the voters choose to have tax extensions. If you don't choose to have tax extensions, we're going to see the education budget get hit significantly. And that's going to have a long-term impact on California. And frankly, this is what we really have to protect because there are three things that drive an economy. Number one is human capital. It's our skill set. The United States for a long time was number one or two in terms of our education of our people. Over recent years, we have dropped to 12th. That is not a way to maintain our prominence and the ability to provide a quality of life for people. Secondly, access to financial capital. The devastation in the wall, uh, what, on Wall Street has really hurt the United States and California. Other places who recognize the innovation and the talents and the abilities of our people and our companies here have come and tried to get California companies to go elsewhere. And in some instances, they have been successful. We need to stop that practice and make sure we design a system that keeps people here in California and make this competitive uh, on, much, on many more levels. And then third, infrastructure. Our infrastructure is far too old to be competitive for this century. We're supposed to be investing $6 billion just for maintenance in the state of California for transportation projects. We're only investing about a billion and a half. So all of that needs to change. Let me uh, ch change a, a very, very different topic. One of the reforms that I was successful in implementing a few years ago was a program called Unclaimed Property. How, ma how many of you are familiar with Unclaimed Property? Okay, a handful. Unclaimed Property uh, takes place when a business owes you money. And so after three years, if they have not returned the money to you, they're supposed to send it to the state. And it's administered by my office. So over two decades, uh, that program was broken in the state of California. Uh, they took some, there was a legislative effort that went, uh, in, went awry. And they made it more difficult for previous controllers to notify Californians and others uh, that the state was in possession of your property. So in my first year in office, I was successful in getting reforms which allowed me to notify you that the state has your property. So over the last four years, we've returned over $1.4 billion of your property and 70 million shares of stock. However, I still have $6 billion more to return. Uh, it's, it's a terrific program. I hope all of you will take a moment or share this information with others uh, because I want you to get your money back. So we ran some names. Uh, I don't know if this is you or not, especially if you have a common name. But so for instance, communication workers, we have four matches ranging from $0.83 cents to $238. Jones & Jones, we have $338 from Bank of America. Caldwell Banker, 144 matches. Latham Watkins, two matches, one for 49 100, the other one for 139 Central City Association, one match for $200. Let me go to some of the individuals. 
Uh, Mark Edwards, 118 matches. Victor Martin, 91 matches. Aaron Green, 31 matches. Dan McCrory, 10 matches. Larry Gray, 33 matches. Kevin Jones, 260 matches. Victor Sampson, 13 matches. John Duong, 19 matches. Ken Sim uh, Sampson, uh, 12 matches. George Milstein, one match for $165. <laughs> the, uh, Roger Grace, three possible matches. Rafael Garcia, 506 matches. And Wynn, 513 matches. Uh, Jeff, uh, there's two, ma two matches, one for five, $599, but I don't, you never lived in Moraga, did you? The, and the other one for. <laughs> And the other one's for $190 from GE Capital Services for pensions. I don't know. I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> uh, Sharon Douglas, 20 matches. Uh, David Eichmann, one match for $53 from Bally's. I'm glad somebody's working out. Uh, Vincent Jones, 45 matches. David Edelman, seven matches. Betsy Johnson, five matches. Brad Cox, 19 matches. Brian Paul, 16 matches. Susan, Susan, uh, yeah, the uh, one match for $92 from. Oh, oh, you know what it is? It says. It says, <laughs> it, it says a promise? You promise? Oh, it, you promise, yeah. It was a, a I, big thing. And actually, I sent my Valley's thing in about 18 months ago. Okay. I still haven't gotten the. Oh, do you know what that means? $3. Okay. Oh. Wow. Well, that's okay. If we're short on that, we'll take care of it. Yeah, if you want to give me a, if you want to give me your card, I'll, I'll check into it. So you just go to my website or and we have a separate website for unclaimed property which is www.claimit.ca.gov uh, the on, on average it takes for the easy accounts less than a month to get your refunds for the more complicated ones involving trusts, wills uh, especially when there's a dispute in the family uh, it obviously takes longer so it can take up to 180 days so I'll end my official remarks and open it up for questions uh, the question for those of you who are not familiar involved redevelopment agencies. My office did a review. We did not do an official audit. There's, if you do an audit, you have to meet certain standards of 18 redevelopment agencies throughout the state of California. In total, there are 425 redevelopment agencies. Uh, what we try to do is we try to have sufficient coverage of the redevelopment agencies. So we pick northern, southern, and central California, urban, rural, suburban and large, medium, and small. What we identified uh, in regards to the redevelopment agencies was that even though there is a statutory definition, there is no common interpretation of blight throughout the state of California. So there is an Inland Empire redevelopment agency that has uh, included in their projects, their works, a four and a half star golf course. So they were using redevelopment agency monies for the greens and the bunkers. And so you have to think about whether that's an appropriate use of redevelopment agencies, agency dollars, especially in view of the fact that uh, these are very lean times and we have very, sh very we're short in terms of taxpayer dollars. Uh, this uh, Coronado, the entire city, and for those of you who are not familiar with Coronado, it's a beautiful area, very upscale. The entire area is a redevelopment agency, redevelopment zone. Uh, and so that's what we identified. We found that also there is no standard definition for job creation. I'm not saying there's no job creation created, right? There's a lot of jobs involved. But for instance, one of the redevelopment agencies would have a single worker who worked on multiple projects count as a job for each of those projects. And you also have to identify some of these jobs are of limited nature. So we need better explanation as to what constitutes a job when you're going to talk about it in regards to public discourse. All of them fail to submit their financial, their fiscal statement, which is a big red flag in my office. When you don't have the basics as to what their expenditures are, it is a red flag. For instance, Bell. Right? If you're not reporting the numbers, how do we know they're doing the right thing? So that's clearly an area that needs to be improved if you continue the redevelopment zones. Now, if they uh, eliminate the redevelopment zones, we need to get a better sense, and it's, we talked a little bit about this earlier, people don't understand taxes in the state of California. People just generally don't understand taxes and the system. 
So we talked about it earlier. The three largest sources of taxes for the state of California are, what's number one? Income. 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 Two? Sales. 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 Three? Corporate. Three? Corporate. Corporate. Good. Property tax, as Gary will tell you, and we can switch places if Gary wants to go through it, <laughs> is, is, is a local tax. Now it has an impact to the state because when you have insufficient property taxes, which a portion of which is used for education, the state has to backfill. That's, and that's one of the findings with the redevelopment agencies. They're supposed to pass through a certain amount of education, or the redevelopment dollars for education. And in total, uh, they failed to pay $40 million in pass-throughs for education. <coughs> and so if people don't understand taxes, and I, uh, we can't have an educated discussion about how we provide revenues for essential programs in the state of California. Also, just as importantly, how do we fashion California to be competitive in the global economy from a tax perspective? People don't understand it. So that's an area where we really need to ramp up uh, education. So that being said, if you look at the revenue sources, income, sales, corporate, local property, we ought to think about how we refresh and tax structure in the state of California. Real estate's traditionally been, in tax theory, a local revenue source. So have been some of the sales taxes. We ought to take some of those tax sources and say, you are dedicated for local government activity. And then you have to trust the local government elected officials to do the right thing, to say, we're going to attach a certain amount of these dollars for public safety, some for parks, some for libraries, and some for economic development. Part of this structure is an avoidance of people accepting the responsibility of making tough decisions as to where money's supposed to go. There, there has been some discussion, but not intense discussion. O oftentimes when you think of and discuss things from a political perspective, it's hard for people to start off in the middle because people in the middle get attacked by both sides. That, that's why generally, that's generally people seem extreme because you start off on one side because you want your base to protect you and then you move to the middle to agree. So the g governor has a tough issue because he, he's trying to identify revenue sources. This is a massive revenue source of $1.7 billion. The other side says we want, want to keep it. There are a few elected officials. There are a few in the private sector saying, let's look at these types of ideas. But I th what happens is it usually goes back and forth. You have the mayors and the redevelopment agencies saying, let's compromise. I think what they're waiting for is, let's see what it looks like specifically. And until we see it, we're going to stay where we are. The redevelopment agencies state, right, whether it's accurate or not accurate, that they create 300,000 jobs. It's difficult for us to do that estimation. As I pointed out, there was no uh, common definition of jobs created. Of the 18 redevelopment agencies that we looked at, eight did not even count the number of jobs uh, created. Four uh, could not explain the methodology. And as I pointed out in one of the instances, one of them counted the same position or one person doing multiple positions as four or five different types of jobs. In addition, the monies that would, if you didn't go to redevelopment agencies, would go to education, police, firefighters, uh, and it's, so you're also looking at, yes, redevelopment agency creates jobs on this sense, but what are you replacing on the other type of sense? So we don't have a clear sense of all those things. I think it's important as we go forward, the League of California Cities, redevelopment agencies, represented from the governor's office, the director of finance, independence uh, analysts like the ledge analysts or the state auditor all come together, agree, and then we can measure. I think it gives us a better sense of what, what was actually created and what was replaced. The governor seems to be open, uh, well he is open, uh, to what he's waiting for the five Republican legislators are willing to negotiate. There's discussion of uh, regulatory reform, there's discussion of pension reform, there was uh, discussion externally, I haven't heard about it internally, about the period of time by which the tax extensions would apply. So they, I think it's whatever they agree to, uh, to fashion a compromise so that hopefully we have something in place by June 30th. You need 131 days once the legislature and governor come to agreement to p place a measure on the ballot. And the cities need 88 days uh, in terms of being able to react once they know that there's a ballot measure coming in. So uh, the, 
the figures that we're talking about where governor wanted a decision by yesterday uh, would apply to an early June election. Obviously, you can push it back. What I think is materially different uh, than in the past is that the voters of California supported Prop 25 last, uh, last year, which says if you don't have a budget in place, the legislators will not be paid. That, 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 that will have an influence. It will have a strong influence. We will not see, well, I do not anticipate we're going to have another year where it's going to take over, uh, it's going to take 100 days to get a budget in place. We have limited taxpayer dollars. We ought to be making sure that we have optimal effectiveness. One of the things that I've always tried to articulate in government is that we need hard metrics. You have to go up and measure. So one of the things that we were targeting is that the most successful controller uh, in California history prior to my service in terms of audits identified $2.5 billion in abuse, waste, and fraud. Now obviously you can get to the, those numbers in different ways, but in my first four years, we, we matched that. So we were twice as effective. But it also triggers what audits you're looking at, right? We were looking at big numbers where we were just trying to move the dial to capture big numbers. Now we're looking at things selectively. So my office, when you talk about RDA audits or other types of audits, what the pu general public doesn't understand is that I have this incredible efficiency in my office. I have only eight. I have eight unearmarked auditors in the controller's office. We have less than 200 auditors altogether. The remainder of my audits have specific functions as designated by the legislature. So when we do the Bell audit, where you have tons of hours, and if you hired somebody in the private sector to do those audits, it would have cost $500,000. My auditors did that. This redevelopment agency, a handful of auditors. But part of it is also, you try to do the balance of, we'd like to have more auditors. One of the things I offered to Governor Schwarzenegger four years ago, I said, I need more auditors for local government. There is going to be a crisis in local government. I recognized it early, right, before all this stuff was doing, because I said, when you, I deal with financial personnel, and no matter how smart, how bright, how talented you are, but I'm looking at staff that's 27 and 25, handling complicated reports that veterans who've been there for 30 years are challenged to understand, you're going to understand you're going to have fiscal issues because it's just too complex. Term limits has led to uh, um, the deteriorating governance, uh, which obviously our, impacts our ability to handle fiscal crisis. Uh, I, and we talked a little bit about this here, I would argue that government is like most other human institutions, right? People in government aren't different than people in the human sector. Obviously, you have situations that are different. You have structures that are a little bit different. But as in the private sector, you have in government people who are extraordinarily bright and talented and hardworking. And in the old days, right, they can bring some stability. They bring experience and expertise to the discussion. There's nothing like somebody who could say, this is what happened in 64, and this is why we did it. This is what happened in 80, and this is why we did it. This, we tried that in 89. That's why it didn't work at that time. If you maybe nick it for this time, this is how it might apply. I talk to people who are incredibly hardworking. I'll talk to them about bills that they're carrying, but they don't have a deep sense of understanding. So you have other institutional players that have an impact. And the difference between government and other places is if you have somebody who's extreme or dysfunctional, oftentimes they have an audience, they have a constituency, and it makes it more difficult. So I think having people that have greater experience can create a, a better balance, which would be healthier for our democracy. Before I thank John, when you get an invitation to my next fundraising event, remember when you came here, the state controller was giving you money back. <laughs> so please join me in thanking an extraordinary elected official and wishing him well. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.